a level one would be significantly more difficult, significantly more challenging. And these levels actually reflect our current governance systems. So a level one would be Stephen Harper, and a level seven is us, a level two would be our element, a level three would be our mayor. So if we want to start making change, what levels do we want to work at? And I'm not going to answer that for you at all. That's our choice to make. Of course, diversity is great and really important. But I want you to put on your little thinking hat to go, OK, what one works best for me? What level do I want to spend my energies working at? So for myself, I'm working at mostly level seven, because that's what I feel works best for me and where I can have the most impact. So working with myself and my community, and that's exactly what we're actually all doing here today is we're working at this really small level and we're making change. Now with our communities, there's another little question for you, what level do you want to work at? What level do we want to work at? Uh, there's a lot of different communities in Calgary and obviously across the world, which is very exciting, uh, working towards really the same big picture, the same goals, the same visions, making positive change, working together, having a holistic, synergistic, beautiful earth for us and for all the other creatures and plants and organisms that we share with us. So one of the challenges we have is, is sort of how do we all work together? Because diversity is good when we're governing ourselves. So we had a couple of really three sort of specific examples of you in the city of Calgary. So this is focusing in our urban community. And one of the things that I know myself I'm really challenged by is I'm really interested in all these different things going on in the city, and I don't have time to make it to every single one. So myself, this is actually my first Evolver Inside Guys session I've actually ever been to, even though I've known about it for over. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I've known about them for a really long time, and I've wanted to attend, but it just hasn't fit in with my schedule and everything that I do. So one of the things that we can do is we can have a network convergence. So for maybe once or twice a year, we actually have a big convergence where all these people and organizations and groups are really working towards the same thing, can converge and, and share ideas, share concepts, share things that are working. And we don't necessarily have to be experts in everything because that's impossible, you know, like think it isn't. Um, <laughs> but we can have that chance to learn more and, and really support ourselves as a community on that level seven. And if we do these, people are going to start coming and listening from those higher levels, which is really important to think about. Instead of trying to go there and make change on a level one, which, think about the tree trunk, you start chipping away at that trunk, you can have a really big problem. They're going to start coming down to us and listening to what we have to say and what we're doing. We can also share information. And this is really, really simple. Is if I, I, I'm on the Permaculture Calgary board, Gail, it's pretty exciting if I want to learn about it, let me know. Um, but one easy thing is to really just share information, go, hey, here's our monthly newsletter, take a look and read it. And if other groups all start sort of cross-pollinating, there you go at the bottom, we can cross-pollinate and do this information sharing, and that way something does intrigue someone else from another group, at least they have the opportunity to be aware of it, and possibly be able to take action if they have the ability and the needs. And also, by cross-pollinating, it doesn't just have to be digital by information sharing. It can also be actually going to things. So for example, maybe somebody from the Permaculture Calgary Guild to start coming to an Evolver meeting and then going back and actually sharing maybe a little brief summary of what they learned or an experience they had. So just a, a, a different way of looking at how can we govern ourselves. So instead of promoting governance at this big municipal level, or this federal level, we can start self-governing ourselves. And as we do things within numbers, we grow support with our community because all of a sudden it becomes the norm if we start doing all these crazy macro things. Uh, but everybody's doing it, it's normal. And then we're going to have this huge exponential growth level of change. So when it comes to government, governance, this is sort of the permaculture hat on. What level do you want to work at? How can we communicate with each other within our different communities to be bringing those together? And then how can we move forward? So I'm really excited to be here today, and uh, I think I want to turn it over to our next topic, energy. Oh, perfect. <laughs> By the way, thanks, Jared, for giving our slides. <laughs> for us. Um, so basically, we all know that there is a wide variety of energy alternatives out there that we can 
start considering um, adding in or changing within our communities. Um, but we struggle, you know, talking about this governance thing is working at that number one level, trying to get that number one level to implement this change. Um, just recently I, I read uh, some, um, there's a place in British Columbia that's right next to the ocean. It's kind of near Vancouver. And I guess what they're saying is what they're building on there, I think they're building like a gas mine or something. But what they're saying is that it's going to mess up the energy fluctuations in British Columbia. So I, I, I don't understand why they are doing that instead of putting in like a geothermal lab, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Why are they contributing to things, you know, the government is continually contributing to things that are damaging our environment or causing more change or more damage than bringing it back up into these solution-based solution ideas. And it's like directly affecting what they could be using instead. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I don't know why the government does this. I don't know if it's because they're uneducated or because it's easier or because they have the money or whatever it is. But this is kind of where we're going to get to is we know there's all these alternatives out there and it's amazing and we struggle at trying to get to the number one to be like change, change, change. So the options that we have in working with our communities is looking at a few different things like why don't we work in power and numbers? Potentially, we can have like a whole community that just installs rocket mass eaters in their house. And then what is, what is the government going to do? The government can choose to tear all of those rocket mass eaters out, or they can choose to let them stay and, and use that as an example. They could do one thing or the other, and we would have to be prepared for that, but that's just one option. It, you know, you have to weigh out what risks you want to take within your community. Another option that takes less risk would be something like, you know, you have a community garden, why not build a rocket mass bench? in your community garden, right? And then the whole community can see that this is working, um, it's something that is saving the community energy and money, and then the government can start seeing examples that way as well. Chelsea? Can you explain what a rocket mass anything is? Sure. <laughs> so, um, it's talking about some of these ideas of different energy potential, so thermal mass is something, Chrissy's got a book right there actually for anyone who's interested in taking a look. Um, thermal mass is something that's really amazing. Um, it starts, thermal mass can be anything from like cob, um, which is natural building with clay, sand and straw, to um, like insulation in your flooring, to what, what else am I missing for thermal mass? What, could be, what else could be thermal mass? Okay. Water could be a thermal mass, so there's just examples right there for you. Um, and what a rocket mass heater is, is basically you have a place where you put your energy or your fire, right? That fire moves through a combustion chamber and then goes through your thermal mass, which in this case would be cob, and basically retains, heats up really quickly and retains heat for an extensive period of time. And you can use these things for water heaters, um, to cook on top of, to warm your bum if you're cold, um, to heat your house. So that's just one one example of a thermal mass solution. Uh, Aaron? Um, I did some uh, gardening down in uh, Grand Forks in 2009 uh, for the summer. And uh, one of the uh, things that they were doing is making their own um, um, fireplaces with brick and with a lot of you know, cement so that and they were doing it in a way that would allow distribution of the heat so that traditionally they would be using in Grand Forks in the winter maybe five or six floors. Now they're using one and a half to two floors of wood. Yeah, so that's like a great example. In the cob oven that we have at the area, we use a very small amount of wood to burn a fire for about four or five hours that allows for us to cook or bake for another five or six hours and then do things like dehydrating and fermenting and doing all sorts of things. So it's extremely efficient and it's also extremely uh, inexpensive and easy to source out materials for some of these items. So there's other things, so um, water, solar, we all know what solar energy can do. Um, do we create things like windbreaks. So the way that we would design our system and making sure that we're efficiently catching the energy in our yard to, to provide for our home. Um, earthen buildings, so 
again, building into the earth is going to be an insulator for you, and then composting and human air. So these are two things that I know I'm passionate about, I think Chrissy and Luke are probably passionate about it too, is when we compost our food, and when we compost our poo, no one likes talking about this, but this, like, our poo is so nutrient rich, <laughs> So when we compost our poo and then we put that back into our soil, into our garden, we're getting the most nutrient-rich soil, and it's gonna, it's going to basically replenish our system rather than degrade it. Um, and when I say, when I talk about composting our poo, we want to make sure we are composting our poo safely and properly, um, but also composting our food and using things like vermipods and things like that, where we can get that nutrient coming from. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, Franco. Hi, Franco. I just wanted to mention a very important individual. The gentleman's name is Nikolai Tesla. Yeah. And of course, like his parents were stolen from him and whatnot. But you know, on your list there, it needs to be you know like getting that back. Like we have to have disclosure, right? Yeah. I think that's fantastic, and that kind of breeds into, um, well, I'll do one quick example and then I'll breed into kind of touching on what you were saying, Franco, is um, basically, Chrissy found this great example that the city has installed 150 solar panels onto the top of the Southland Leisure Centre, and basically they expect to get a complete cost return on that within 20 years. So a 20 years seems like a long time, but when we really think about like how long have your parents owned their house for, or how long are you planning to own your home for, right, or be in your community for, we when we build strong communities, we want to stay there for a while, right? So it's worth making this investment and getting this return back. And then after that 20 years, then guess what? Like we're making this for our next generation that they basically are getting free energy. So, um, or next to free energy. So there's just things that we can think of down the road. Touching on what Frank was saying is, you know, when Chrissy and Luke and I were putting together this project, and even when we were brainstorming at a Revolver event, is we're like, we don't know anything about all these new technologies or old technologies of, of energy and all these great things. So this is where we need to, again, source back out to the community and look for these experts. I know that in this group of people, I would say, I don't know all of you personally, but I'm gonna guess that each of you is an extremely intelligent individual with great ideas and great resources. So reaching out to the community and being like, who do we know that has this experience in dealing with alternative sources of energy or, or technology and who can help us to create some new ways that we don't even know about yet, or again, touching in on some of the older technologies and, and figuring out how to understand some of that research and put that into action. So if anybody out there know, it is that person or knows that person, then please like reach out to the different communities and make sure that you're sharing that knowledge so that we can start moving forward with these things. Hmm. So I think we can move to the next slide. So these are just some examples for you guys. Um, there is an eco home in Scenic Acres, and there's just a picture of it here to, the, to your guys' right. Um, and then Dirtcraft right now in the city is offering courses on Cobb oven workshops, and they've even been doing some rocket mass heater workshops as well. And there's a lot of really good education out there for people. Um, not to plug myself, but I'm even doing some introductory courses to natural building and cob building as well. Um, and then basically the final point is that we know we need to reduce our energy and we know that we need to standardize our energy use within our communities. So this is something again, speaking out to your community associations and letting them know that this is something that we are serious about and encouraging them and letting them know about some of these issues and, and letting them know about some of these possible solutions and build that within your community of, look, we can, we can start actually doing this stuff, whether it be everybody is a big risk taker in your community and wants to install those rocket mass heaters or maybe, yeah, we just want to put a small example in our community garden or in a community space of what we can do. Maybe you put solar panels on your community hall. I don't know what it is, right? But any any one of these things is working towards great change. Um, and basically, we know that we have enough of everything, enough energy for every single person on this planet. 
And we, as long as we are returning that surplus back, that we're not being over excessive in our use. So I'm going to turn it over to Christy to talk about some stats, and then um, basically Luke will go into food security after that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be really quick here, but I know with energy it can be really, really overwhelming because you're like, "Ah, oh, I think that's a bunch of solar panels. How do I do this? I can't afford it, or I rent, or it can be really, 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 really hard and big problems." There's some really easy solutions out there, and one of them we're going to focus on is food. So I'm going to do this little pop quiz slash math. If we think about just the, the energy that goes into the food that we eat, it's actually pretty astronomical. So I'm going to give you a little, little hint here before I get you to do some math. But for every one calorie food that we eat in the city, it takes approximately 10 calories of fossil fuels to produce that food. So 10 calories of fossil fuels, whether it's coal, or nuclear energy, or natural gas, goes into one calorie of food that we consume. So 2,000 calories, a million people, how many calories is that in a day of fossil fuels to feed us? A lot. Yeah, like a, a lot. How many barrels of oil? Throw out some numbers, this is just fun. Million. Million. Everybody's like, yeah, we're back to the higher than that. We can save a huge amount. There's exponential returns when we start saving energy. And that's what we really think is very valuable to take home. So when it comes to just even doing something as simple, just poop it in a bucket. Sound doing some glamorous, you know, shaving a bucket appropriately. Or it is glamorous. It's more like shaving's on it after so it smells nice. It smells good. <laughs> we can tell you where to try one out. You speak to us after. Okay, um, but we can have an exponential return sort of on energy investment if you want to look at it that way. And we can start this in our garden. So if you could hit the slide for me, and one day we could save this much oil. If we grew all our food locally without the use of fossil fuels, without the use of artificial synthetic chemical fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides, 13,000 barrels of oil a day. That's pretty fantastic. So this is a great segue into Luke, because he's going to talk about food and food security here in Calgary. So uh, this is a person. Okay. Uh, and then these are barrels of oil. So that's just amazing how that's happening every day in terms of food that we should in the city. Oh, can you speak up a bit? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm a little bit taller than you um, I actually just want to thank everyone who's been involved in the Occupy movement. Um, yeah, big time. Like, I have made fun of myself and I kind of harbor a bit guilt, but I, I think we're all doing our own thing and we're really fine. Uh, just seriously, like, amazing stuff, guys. Um, so, in food security, uh, I get excited about this because it's something that I think everyone can get access to very easily. The barriers to entry in terms of growing around food are very low. Um, uh, for example, like, kind of referencing back to when Chrissy brought up that tree and, uh, and the level one and the level seven, um, I think food, growing our own food is obviously something you know, we do in our own life on a small scale, but uh, as more people start doing it, you know, we have this um, critical mass kind of thing happening. Um, myself, I hadn't grown any of my own food before last summer, and I found it actually to be, look a bit of stuff, I do a lot of study actually, but um, even just some of the opportunities I'll talk about to get free information, you can get enough that you would need to know to actually effectively grow your own food. I, I literally grew uh, a couple of months of my own food last year, and it's really fun. Um, so I think some of the, I'll talk about a couple things. Um, land access being the first one, obviously that's going to be key in terms of growing food. Maybe you guys know about this organization in Calgary called um, Landshare. That's right over there. But that was started up actually in the UK, and it's like exploding like crazy over there. There's like 60,000 people registered, and there's been over 20-some thousand successful connections. So it's just getting going in Calgary. Um, I've been able to find now two different land access opportunities. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll chat a bit about that later, but it's, uh, it's actually quite easy to find people who are willing to give up their lawn or give up uh, even community garden space. And uh, uh, you know, personally for me, I found it 
like really fun, also quite therapeutic. Um, really opened my eyes to uh, to nature and what, how, how incredible this, these natural systems are. And especially because I was gardening in a very ecological way, so um, you know, quite easy. And, and speaking about that, some some places where people, I think, so get you, once you have land, you can, you can do it, but now there's this the personal barriers of fear, which I totally came up against last year, like I have no clue what I'm doing, this is sketchy, I don't want it to look bad, I don't want to fail. Um, so what I did is I went out to these things called permablitzes, which uh, are essentially a free opportunity to learn about growing food in the city, and in the meantime, lend your hands and your effort to, uh, to help someone install an edible garden or an edible landscape uh, in the place of a lawn. So um, I always like to say, destroy your lawn before it destroys you. <laughs> the lawn is one of the most secret culprits at separating us from nature, separating us from our roots. It's incredibly unnatural and um, it won't even get into the amount of energy that it's used to, uh, to, to grow these, these, these grass fields. Um, actually, here, I will. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, there's a, there's a little fact. Um, uh, in the United States, they have between, uh, and just, just imagine the numbers are going to be similar for Canada, maybe even worse. Um, 40 to 50 million acres of lawn are planted in the United States, and that's actually uh, just less than the amount of lawn, total land that's planted out to wheat. So we're, we're cultivating as much lawn as we are wheat, um, our <laughs> biggest lawn crops. So I just think that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I also know that all of this lawn space that's being used to basically do nothing. I think lawns are great sometimes when kids and dogs are playing on them and whatnot, but other than that, it's like, what are we doing? Um, but if we actually flip this lawn space into just growing wheat again, um, which is pretty unproductive compared to a perennial polyculture of trees and shrubs, um, we could grow enough food to feed the whole, or if the United States did this, they would feed themselves, the whole country, 300 million people for two years off of one crop off of these lawns. So I think we're sitting here with this amazing opportunity to grow food. Um, and uh, and a perma, coming up to a perma blitz through Permaculture Calgary, is a great way to get that information. So that's that, and that's actually really where I learned the hands-on skills and got the confidence to do it on my own yard was through uh, having someone guide me and also getting free food because when you come out to a farm blitz, you get food, and if you stay late, you usually get drinks too. Um, so they're a really great place, great place to meet people. Uh, Steven to the top, sorry, her name, bro, in the back. I got a jacket. Um, <laughs> I've had his jacket for months. You might uh, Thank you. run into that guy. I might run into that guy. So I think that, um, anyways, that's a great opportunity. And, and if you're wanting to take courses and workshops, there's tons of those in the city too. So the next step would be uh, understanding our environment or what's going on in our local uh, ecology. And again, you can get that type of information at the permit blitz, asking the designers or some of the other educated people that are on site. And experiment. This is fun. I mean, it's complete. I completely flipped my mindset from being this like scared new person who didn't know what I was doing to being like nobody really knows what they're doing. Really, even some of the people who are very, very skilled and knowledgeable in this, they're experimenting too with everything they're doing. So, even if we have you know ten years of experience, we're technically still in the same boat because the plants are doing their own thing. They're evolving on their own. Uh, we're just stewarding them. Okay, so nutrient cycling, and this comes back to the notion of um, waste. Waste is a resource, just an unused resource, kind of another paradigm shift, and the uh, putting into buckets notion. I actually didn't touch on how that relates to energy as well. I think it's something like 20 to 30 percent of the total energy uh, consumption of the city of Calgary, or like most modern cities, goes into pumping water and uh, pumping sewage around. So. Uh, I just think that's another way to tackle the energy thing, and I think a lot of the things that, when it comes down to energy, it comes down to reduction, and all of this crazy wasted energy that we're putting out there. I'm gonna say one thing about that. Yeah. Just consider how many people in the world go without drinking water, and we are shitting into our drinking water. Just something to think about next time you go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you don't see other animals getting away with that kind of behavior. Yeah, don't feel guilty. Just, just try pooping in a bucket once. <laughs> but, but 
realistically, if other animals did that, they wouldn't, they wouldn't make it, right? They, they would be ruining their drinking water. It's absolutely crazy. Um, so recognize the value in all living things. This is a really relaxing perspective when it comes to gardening because it, it touches on the notion of weeding, and, uh, which I think is one of the biggest barriers to gardening. People are like, oh, it's so much work, right? But actually, most of these plants we consider weeds are very useful. They accumulate nutrients in the soil. They're super fast growing. If they're edible or medicinal, of course, that's another benefit. So um, yeah, recognizing the value in all living things and also in natural systems. I mean, you guys, I don't think anyone here hates nature. Um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, number eight, or wait, we got five, six, eight, and seven. Oh, this. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> It's the first time, first time presentation. I don't feel very high pressure. Um, okay, so recognizing the efficiency of systems, and this comes down to how we're gardening, and this is like one of the first steps of knowledge, is um, ways that we can garden ecologically. So essentially looking into a concept called forest gardening, something I highly recommend. It's a very exciting notion that we can plant gardens that mimic uh, natural ecosystems. So it would be like putting up the forest that we knock down to plant the lawn, but putting up the forest in a way that it's all beneficial plants for humans, um, yet also beneficial for the ecology. So tons of information on that. Uh, I think one of the most of the farm blitzes as you'll see are going to incorporate some of these principles, or be, you'll actually be planting a forest garden. Um, so that's really exciting. Just this notion that we can have actually low maintenance food production locally, um, and it can be beautiful and it can be habitat for wildlife. It's kind of like um, very idyllic, actually. I was, I was surprised when I came into this whole world that something so idyllic actually existed and was like practical at the same time. Um, and then uh, I think another thing is knowing what's available out there, the resources that are available, uh, particularly in ecology, that we can harness, like say rainwater. Something that's really easy to capture and store and use rainwater to water our gardens. Again, knocking out this is probably second biggest um, time expenditure in our gardens, which is watering. So yeah, I mean, I think what it comes down to really is hopefully hopefully you guys can make it up to a drum blitz sometimes too as well. Yeah. And yeah, we'll pass off to um, Kim to do the close here. So we kind of touched on a lot of different ideas in this presentation and basically in closing, I really just wanted to emphasize how we have the ability to really start taking action right now. We don't have to wait for someone up here to make a decision about when we can start taking action. There's things that we can be doing in our own lives every day that are really easy um, to take action and to start making a difference. So basically, I, I kind of broke it down into the three sections again, and I'm just going to kind of go through them really quickly. So in governance, so number one, share your knowledge. Right? We have, we are empowered people to be able to share our knowledge with other people and help people and teach other people things that we're doing in our lives um, that are making the world better. And we don't have to look up to the government. We need to look up to each other. Or not even look up to each other, look to each other. And start teaching each other and don't be afraid to share the knowledge you have. You, you don't have to have 15 years of experience in something to talk about something. I've been doing permaculture for less than a year. And I love sharing the information about it because it has changed my life and I see how it's making the world better. So if you're doing those things, share those with people. Um, get involved in your community and network. Get involved in, in movements you're passionate about. So part of what we're going to ask for after this talk or after the sessions are done, if you know of organizations doing cool things, come, come over and write them down for us so we can start networking and bringing those groups together. Um, and share examples with your community and about ideas that you find out about. And remember, powers in numbers means that change can happen faster. So when we work together as a group, um, we can start making this change happen even faster. Um, so, and yeah, and getting back on supporting other movements. So making sure we're just keeping in, in the loop about what other things are going on in our city and supporting those people, whether it be just by simply sending them an email being like, hey, I love what you're doing. Send me your newsletter. Um, we, don't, we don't have the time to go to all these meetings, but we can definitely still put the, the energy out there that we support each other and that we want to make sure every, all the diversity is um, 
that we recognize that all the diversity is making a huge difference. And, and leading into that is also supporting individuals and making sure that we're supporting individuals on their paths um, and making sure that we're losing the judgment of where people are at in their lives because we all had to start somewhere, right? And if we can lose that and we can start recognizing the potential in every single being on this planet and supporting them in their potential at the rate that works for them, right? Not rushing them to that, but just, uh, just supporting that, then that's going to make a huge difference as well and allow for people to want to open up more and feel more comfortable um, moving forward on their path. Um, and then also making sure we recognize our capacity to govern ourselves and to govern our communities um, and be an example. So start living the life you want and show others it's possible. Okay? In making sure we do things, alternative economies, local energy transfer systems, calendar dollars, barter trade, time exchange system. Um, energy, build an open letter to the city letting them know what you want for your community and, and give that letter to your community to spread out and, and add what they want into those letters. Start implementing standards for energy and use alternative energy into all new structures that go in the city. Okay, So we need to make sure that we are pushing the city or even just, again, when we develop our own communities, adding in these alternative energies. Um, and compost. Compost in your, you can compost in your apartment with a vermin compost in your yard. And again, if you have the ability or want to, you can do the human manure composting as well. And then down the road, um, basically, we'll, we can make those examples, um, like adding a rocket mass here into your community space, um, and then also start sourcing out the alternatives by looking within your community for people with knowledge, and learn how to make the transfer transformation, let the city know we want the transformation, and understand that we need to have patience in some of these solutions. Food, guerrilla gardening, take, t take the city back. Turn, start just turning those parks and open spaces into gardens if you want to. Then the city might tear it down, but we can just keep showing what we want. Um, and again, the education. Go to the perm blitzes. Source out other, other ways that we can take this idea of the perm blitz and take it into other topics so that we can start getting that education out there and make it free and accessible for people. Um, this is a great idea that can just be shifted into many other areas. Start growing your own food. Um, you can do this on a small scale or a large scale. It doesn't have to be a farm. It can be a bucket. <laughs> um, and also, if you can't grow your own food, then start to support local. And get to know the farmers in our community and start you know, understanding where your food is coming from. There's great things like Calgary Harvest and Calgary Permaculture Guild that you can get involved with as well. Just getting an understanding of um, you know, not wasting food. So let's go pick apples from someone else's yard if they don't want them. We, then we can, we can take them and we can also share that with the community. Um, okay. And then again, the leading by example. All change, big or small, starts with you. So remember that. And it will always, always contribute to a greater global change. Um, and it can be a big change too. We don't know what we're capable of. And then also we can start food share programs in our communities too. So if, if 150 people are growing food in our community and then we have an excess, then we can get together and start sharing that diversity with each other through, for, through those means and building our communities even stronger. Um, so on that note, I, I ran through those really quickly. If you, if anyone in this room has ideas, please share them with Christy, Luke, and I, and we can keep evolving this presentation and adding to it and making it stronger and better so that we can continue to share it with other communities and other people. Um, and I also wanted to really thank everyone that was at the Evolver meeting last Monday for sharing your beautiful hearts and minds um, with us and and helping uh, inspire Chrissy and Luke and I in making this presentation. And you know, again, please share, keep sharing. That's how we're really gonna make the change. <laughs>